Well, thank you very much. It's great to be back as always. Uh, today I'm going to try and do something that's probably fairly controversial, but I hope it'll make you all think and I hope it'll provide some information. The topic is a final solution. I actually had titled this The Final Solution and I was told that I should change that title. But this is really about American society and it's actually a very political presentation that I'm going to make. I will try to cover some stocks that are related to the view that I have in this. This is about the leavening of the American quality of life. Leavening usually means rising, you know, when, you, when bread is leavened, but it also has another definition and that is modification. And what we are seeing now purely from a political standpoint in the U.S. that has implications for, the U, for Americans, for Canadians, and for the rest of the world is a, is a very major change or shift in direction in the economics, in the culture, and in the governing of American society. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we move forward. So the leavening of U.S. society, this is a hypothesis about modification or change and how that's happening. It is very clear that the current administration and the current Congress is all about change in the United States of America. And that change will have very significant implication for all of the kinds of investments we do, but particularly for currency investments and commodity investments. And I'll link that in a little bit later in my presentation. What is the rationale for this change of culture, of this modification of the culture, of the American culture, the American system? Well, first of all, it is obvious that there is an increased interest in government and the part of control. Government does want more control of society. We've seen this with Obamacare, for example, and we have something down there called Obamanomics, which is the economic uh, uh, parallel, if you will, of the Obama administration. But so increased power in government. Government definitely in the U.S. today, you can see it in our president, believes that anybody in government is smarter than the individual. This is called progressive thinking. Progressive ide ideology in the U.S. now, left-wing thinking is now in ascendance. It is in ascendance in Washington. You know, I've always said that Washington is a very strange place where there's an ether, and that ether affects everybody that lives in Washington, D.C., but it's a very dangerous ether for all of us now. What is the means of this modification? Nobody in this room can deny what I'm going to say right now. Think about these things. You hear about them in the press all the time. Executive orders, that is when the president orders a change. Whether it goes against the Constitution or not, it is always considered. We are seeing that now, for instance, with respect to the gun laws and to other things as well. The czars that are in place in Washington that are not constitutional. Legislation like Obamacare that's coming out that was run through the ringer quickly. Challenges to the Constitution. I'll talk about the Second and the Fourteenth Amendments today that are under fire. This is very, very significant happening. Progressive redistribution of wealth. We'll talk about that. Investor repression. If you know what the interest rates are in the U.S. now, you'll notice that they're close to zero or very low. This is investor repression because investors, not only individuals but also institutions, cannot make their real levels of return. Market manipulation is condoned in some cases. We see that in the silver market, the gold market, and of course the currency market. And finally, we haven't seen this yet, but we have seen it historically, and that is confiscation. I'm not forecasting that that will happen, but it certainly historically has, been happen, ha has happened in the past. So what is the effect of this leavening of society? Well, it is a polarization, it is an, ostra an ostracization, and it is to punish the economy's wealth creators because wealth accumulation, at least from the bully pulpit, is considered bad in the states. All you have to do is read the New York Times or the Washington Post and you'll hear that wealth creators are actually bad and they should be punished. And um, so basically what, what happens when that kind of a government interference comes online is that risk taking declines. It's a risk off situation and that hurts capital markets. Instead, people begin to rely on government guarantees, and that's called the entitlement society. This is U.S. per capita debt. I just put a few of them in here. You can see the Bush, the Clinton, the second, uh, the younger Bush, and the Obama administrations. And you can see that as the population in the U.S. rose from 255 million to 315 million, the per capita debt for every single citizen of the United States of America rose 
from $16,379 to $52,152. And those great increases in debt have come in the most recent uh, four, four years of the administration. So debt is the tool that the government is using to uh, socialize the economy. We see that now. And this is not a legacy we want to leave for our children, but it is a legacy that has great implication for, for assets like gold and silver. They talk about the fact that only the rich have been taxed, that only 2% of the population the tax rates have gone up for, but that is not the case. The uh, Social Security tax, or the employee tax, the employer tax also increased, and this took $100 billion out of the market instantaneously as the so-called fiscal cliff was dealt with a couple of weeks ago. So you can see that if you make $50,000 a year in the states, you pay an extra $83 a month in taxes. That's a couple of, of uh, uh, fills of gasoline at least. If you make $110,000, you pay an extra $183 a month. So this is again taking from the, con the consumption-based society and uh, uh, putting it into uh, a taxation situation. So this is $100 billion that the average Joe, that name has been kicked around a lot by our politicians in the states, that the average Joe rate wage earner now is losing. So what about sequestration? Does everybody know what sequestration is? Supposedly, we were supposed to be able to cut spending, especially in defense and in other areas like Medicare and Medicaid, and entitlement spending in particular. Well, we've raised taxes on not only the top 2%, but everybody that, that makes any money uh, in, in, uh, in the states. But we've also kicked sequestration or spending cuts far, far down the road. It is uh, a very prime example of how US politicians think. Increase taxes, increase spending, continue to run huge deficits, continue to pile up debt, continue to modify or change the US economy. This is just the beginning. Uh, you only have to follow what's happening in Washington, either from the bully pulpit, from the Federal Reserve, from the Treasury. We have a new Treasury person coming in named Jack Lew, who is a violent, virulent defender of entitlement spending. And he will be the new Treasury Secretary. He will be nominated. The newly anointed princelings in, in Washington have much more in mind for all of us Americans and for all Canadians and the rest of the world as the U.S. economy is affected. So it is not only the wealthy that must quote unquote pay their fair share, it is all of us that will pay our fair share as the quality of life in the U.S. is leavened, is changed, and declines. And I should point out there's been a lot of academic material written on this idea of convergence. That is, other economies increasing their quality of life while the West leavens or decreases its quality of life. That is now happening, but it's happening in the U.S. from a pol purely political point of view. This is a title from the New York Times that I just threw in here. It says, the debt ceiling is scarier than the fiscal cliff, and we now are facing in the next two months an issue of does the debt ceiling persist and obtain, or does it go away? Uh, should we just throw away the debt ceiling and continue to pile up debt? or should we, should we pay attention to it? And the New York Times in its left-wing status basically says, if the borrowing limit isn't raised, then spending would contract by 6%, you see, because the US is almost entirely a consumer-based economy. That spending would, con would uh, 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 contract by 6%, followed by a swift recession. And um, so the question then is, do we, do we, do we pay our dues and do we uh, deal with uh, Congress and, and the debt ceiling or not. There are now executive challenges, executive meaning the office of the president and the administration to the U.S. Constitution. And we haven't, we've had, we've had constitutional challenges before. I think they're more serious today. For example, the second amendment to the Constitution, one of the original ten amendments, talks about um, the right to bear arms. This is a very, very politically tossed situation in which executive orders are now starting to flow forth from the White House to change this, uh, the effect of this amendment. The 14th Amendment also is very significant. It basically says the validity of the public debt, or talks about the validity of the public debt in the U.S. It says that which is authorized by law, including debts incurred 
incurred for payments of pensions, bounties for services, shall not be questioned. And um, that's what's going on in Washington. And then if you read the rest of the 14th Amendment, it says, but neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation. Let me, let me read that again. Neither the United States or any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in the, in the aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss of emancipation of any slave, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. And so there is a clause in the 14th Amendment which may uh, provide an out for some in Washington. So the 14th Amendment debt ceiling option, the House Democrats support Obama's use of power to ignore or to raise it, to ignore the debt ceiling entirely or to raise it. I, I did this presentation before yesterday and yesterday I found out that the Republicans in the House have decided that they will raise the debt ceiling temporarily for three months to go down the road. So, you know, again, we're kicking everything down the road and not paying attention to what we should be paying in terms of the society. So the Republicans are in the bag on this. The question then is, can the Obama administration, with support of Democrats in Congress, unilaterally and by executive order, either raise the debt ceiling or ignore the debt ceiling based on the 14th Amendment? And if so, if so, if the debt ceiling no longer matters, that we run $16 trillion in debt and we will ultimately run 30 to $50 trillion in debt in, this, in the United States of America. What are the consequences for American, Canadian, and global investors? And I'll try and cover that. This is President Obama, who has been the most polarizing president in the history of the Republic, comment about um, four or five days ago in the news conference that he uh, gave. He said, if Congress, the Republican House he's speaking of, wants to have a debate about this, maybe we shouldn't go out to dinner next time. That's fine. So this is the kind of polarization we're seeing politically in the United States right now. It is a president who has decided on the kinds of action he will take, and he will not give in. He will push this. And he would have gone over the fiscal cliff had not the Republicans uh, caved on, on the issues that they caved on. And he says, we've got to stop lurching from crisis to crisis to crisis. But as an aside, I say as long as the U.S. Federal Reserve, and we saw this in the, in the uh, most recent presentation uh, that was uh, done up here, keeps blowing asset bubbles, and you saw plenty of examples of bubbles in the economy uh, from the previous presenter, then we will continue to lurch forward and we will continue to push down the road and we will continue to increase debt until it's virtually unsustainable. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in an interview I think last weekend, basically uh, would use the 14th Amendment to either raise or, in her terms, ignore the debt ceiling. So you have politicians now who are saying, let's ignore the Constitution. They're trying to find clauses in the Constitution that will allow it to be ignored and to, and to move away from, and hence to willy-nilly issue debt to, to service all the problems, all the entitlement problems and, and concerns that we have in the economy. And she has said, um, I've made my view very clear on the subject. I would do it in a second, but I'm not the President of the United States. Thank God she's not the President of the United States. Why should we worry? Well, because there's an increasing polarization of ideas and people and groups in the United States of America. And it, it's not violent yet, but it could be violent at some point in the future. It's happened before. NRA membership, that's the National Rifle Association, was up 250,000 in a week. That's 0.08% of, of the entire population. And there are 4.25 million uh, members of the uh, National Rifle Association. Guns have never sold faster in the United States uh, than at the point in which uh, the Obama administration has issued executive orders governing the use of handguns. And uh, by the way, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe in um, and assault rifles and things like that either. But you're seeing this, you're seeing, these are facts, this is what you're seeing happening in the U.S. The population of the U.S. is 315 million people, 128 million Americans, just think about this, 44%. 128 million Americans get some significant form of government entitlement. And that will soon be more than half the population because, like me, uh, there are a lot of baby boomers that are starting to bloom 
And uh, so there's going to be a very large population of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the, the big third rails of, the, of our existence that can't be financed well that are going to be in this game. And so what are you seeing happening? You're seeing the Germans, for example, because we saw the Venezuelans do this, but that's another story for another day. But you're seeing the Germans now, the Bundesbank, uh, repatriating six, or attempting, beginning to repatriate 674 tons of gold. That will take about five or six or seven years to do. This makes sense. Why would they do this? Because they are seeing these facts playing out in Washington, and these facts are going to play out increasingly for the next four to ten years. So here's what the new structure of the economy is going to look like. We will keep issuing debt. We will keep pushing entitlement uh, spending down the road. We will keep increasing entitlement spending. This is a CBOE uh, presentation. Um, and you can see that sometime about 2030, which is not all that far in the future, we will have amassed 200 percent uh, federal debt uh, in relative to GDP. So if our GDP is 15, billion, trillion, sorry, I get mixed up between trillions and billions sometimes, but trillion is a lot more, uh, then, then the debt will be 30, 40, or 50. And this is exactly what the Obama administration wants to do. That's my hypothesis, my thesis in this presentation. Because when that happens, the current structure will not be sustainable and the government will have to step in and reorganize the economy. So in terms of the uh, uh, Congressional Budget Office, it says that the debt would, would reach 250 percent by 2035. This would be a, an anchor on GDP, on growth. So lowering growth. Debt will definitely work inversely with growth. Increase debt, decrease growth in the economy. And that has very significant implications for the U.S. economy and the Canadian economy. In 2035, according to the CBO, GNP would be 21 percent below benchmark under the assumptions leading to the most negative effect on GNP. Beyond 2035, the negative effect on GNP would grow under those assumptions as debt continues to increase relative to the size of the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my hypothesis, my belief, given what I've seen and what I've um, watched over the last few years, that this administration and this Congress is intent on increasing the debt load until it is no longer sustainable and the government has to step in and reorganize the economy. What are some facts? Facts about the leavened nature of American society. This has been on both watches, both the Republicans and the Democrats. I'm not just hitting on the Democrats at this stage. 44% of the population gets some form of transfer payment from government. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, unemployment, food stamps, child care. There is chronic structural unemployment and underemployment. Underemployment is understated, actually. It's about 17 or 18 percent of the population is underemployed at present. There's about 7.9 percent that are, according to the uh, Labor Department, that are unemployed. And of course, the Fed says we're going to keep pumping money into this economy until either the inflation rate goes up or employment, uh, unemployment goes down to 6.5 percent. So the, don't believe the talk that QE3 is over. It is not. And so they will, they will try to inflate this economy. And when they do that, they will increase the federal debt very, very significantly. Um, stagnation of real income. Real income has not increased for Americans on a per capita basis in 12 years. It's stayed steady. So, uh, and of course, the price of goods has, has increased. Facts about the leaven nature of American society. In, if you watch it closely, as I do, and I lecture at the Fed twice a year, as you know, entitlement spending is now beginning to go viral. The food stamp spending by itself, 43 million people in the U.S. are on food stamps right now, and it is not sufficient. The amount of spending on food stamps is not sufficient to keep people from being hungry. So there's going to be more, a lot more spending there. We're seeing a viral n nature here. The tax and spend dynamics are firmly in place. It was supposed to be tax and reduce spending. It is not now. The Obama administration has a clear-cut victory. It is tax and increase spending. That's what's going to happen. That is what is happening now. That's what happened with the recent fiscal cliff de debacle. And mark my words, in the next two months, the, public, the, Republic, the Republicans will cave on the spending and entitlement issue. It will happen. They've already caved by increasing the uh, the debt uh, limitation. 
slower growth, more revenue. When they talk about revenue in Washington, they're talking about taxes. So if you're an American or you have American assets or you're a Canadian with a certain level of American investment, beware, because taxes are going up very significantly in the U.S. It's just begun. It's just started. And more spending. So if you're on the dole or you need help, you're going to get it because there's going to be more entitlement spending and more taxation and hence more redistribution of wealth in the U.S. The growth will have to be slower and, and income will, be, will continue to be static, real income. We have now turned the corner in the second administration of, of Barack Obama. Politics, not economics, is now the driving force, period, end of story. There is a polarization we have never, I don't recall having seen before in the history of the Republic or having read about, a polarization, a polarization of sides, of opinions, and it seems like the progressives are in, in ascendance here. There's a huge immigration plan coming to bring more and more people into the country, so the 315 million will increase significantly. And from a demographic viewpoint, Baby boomers like me are going to expand and flower, and they're going to need Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the other entitlement spending things that go along with it. In addition, we really are looking at what we, call, what we have called, you'll see it in the next two years, Obamanomics. Obamanomics is about the new socialist state, and the new socialist state is about the leavening of American society. We are moving back. By the way, this has happened before in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's. After the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt instituted Social Security and a number of other uh, program, many other programs. Lyndon Johnson did it, in the, you'll remember, in the late 60s with guns and butter. We thought we could live that way, and it's just ballooned. And so here we are at the end of the tunnel, but, and the difference now is we cannot simply can this be sustained? Can this vast increase in government control and government spending be sustained? And the answer is, of course, it cannot. No bubble can be sustained. So which third rails are now in play? Well, this is going to be a good debate, and I can't answer them all. Will they cut defense? I don't know. I'm not sure. Defense has always been the key to having the reserve currency dollar. A strong army, a strong military has always been key, uh, uh, has always been supported by um, uh, a strong uh, uh, dollar. Health care. Health care is going to be a lot more expensive, so there's going to be more spending on health care under, Obama, under Obamacare. Unemployment insurance, we keep lengthening it out. And I was talking to some my good Canadian friends last night, and they're saying, that's in Canada, this is what you get. And after this, you're finished. That is not the case in the States. In the States, we keep increasing the unemployment insurance rate. We just did it uh, with one of the fiscal cliff issues from the last couple of weeks. And food stamps are going to increase quite dramatically. This is simply one, the Recovery, Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 was almost a trillion dollars, one act. One single act was almost a trillion dollars, 840 billion. Some of it was taxation. Uh, some of it was credits, grants, and loans. Um, and about a third of it was entitlements. So $241 billion in one single act, in one single year, to entitlement spending. That's the kind of spending we're doing in, uh, in the U.S. And what are the entitlements? Well, I won't go through them. There, there are so many that it would take me an hour to do them all. But clearly the important ones, Medicare and Medicaid, are not sustainable. Uh, uh, if you earn, um, if you earn $50,000 a year, your Medicaid premium is $90 a month. If you earn a, um, more than that, if you earn $150,000 a year, your Medicaid premium is $390 a month. So they're already beginning to graduate this. But these are huge, huge entitlement programs that ultimately have to be restructured. And the Obama administration may be doing that in the future. Unemployment insurance is uh, $61 trillion, billion, billion dollars. Uh, family services is 45 and so on and so forth down the list. One act in 2009 put that. So the current deficit and the current debt ceiling, well, even with the avoidance of fiscal cliff, the current deficit and the increase in taxation on the top 2.5% and the 2% increase on everybody else, the current deficit will still be over a trillion dollars a year. We're not, even, we're not even making any dent in what the amount of debt increase is, uh, is going to be. There are 235 federal entitlement programs. By 2030, I believe it is the plan 
that we should run a $30 trillion debt, federal debt, and of course that boils down to around $100,000 per citizen at that point in time, where we're at the level of Greece or even beyond the level of Greece. Is it sustainable? Is it sustainable with a big army and the, the, the main currency of the world, the reserve currency of the world? Sooner or later, it is not sustainable. And when it is not sustainable, the government need, will need to reorganize the economy along socialist lines. And that is the plan, in, in my opinion, in the country. What are the catalysts? They're happening every single day. And every single day, the current administration and the current Congress get stronger and individuals get become weaker. President Obama's fiscal cliff victory tilts the playing field to progressives, to liberals, for at least the next four years and probably beyond because it is possible that another uh, first woman president might follow Barack Obama. That's only a possibility. What will we have? We will have taxes, we will have taxes, and we'll have m explicit taxation. And we will, because we have that, we will have reduced risk taking. It will be a risk off trade in the U.S. economy. And this will encourage dependence uh, on the government, which is already beginning to happen by half the population at least. And it will reduce organic economic growth. Growth will suffer. Growth is already suffering. This will result in increased government. That is the overview of the government. And already we are seeing invisible taxation. You may, you may not even know this in the States, it's also in Canada. And that is via investor uh, repression, that is very low interest rates, that's taxation, and inflation. And uh, although they say there is no inflation, I can assure you there is. So these are the issues. So default or not, um, ultimately, yes, but they'll push this thing down the road and connive until they deal with it. Leftist political control is becoming more likely, even certain. We've had this before. We had it in the 1930s. The war took us out of it. The World War II took us out of it and put us into a new, a new uh, a time period. I don't see that happening again. So leftist political control is becoming more likely, even certain, given the demographics and expectancy of the entitlement economy, society. So this is the, the solution. This is the new solution to how we deal with the future as we pile up more debt. Who will challenge spending, that is entitlements? No one will challenge. No Republican is going to challenge the entitlement spending. They have already failed. And Democrats certainly won't either. Who will not support revenue, that is taxation? No one. We're, they're going up in terms of taxation. It's just a matter of time. Wealth redistribution is now a certainty. Taxation and increased spending. Uh, will maintain political control for whomever is in power. Uh, there is a Tea Party, by the way, but it's beginning to shrink. It's beginning to fray at the, at the edges. Um, and we've seen that in the recent decisions that have gone down in Washington. Entitlement philosophy in the U.S. Has, has been since 1950, has been growing since 1950. It is now firmly in place. It's firmly in, enshrined in our economy and in our culture, and that's going to continue. Government wants us to believe in the elusive G word, that is the guarantee. We guarantee these issues, food stamps, unemployment, um, uh, medical care. That's what Obamacare is all about. So, and and uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a message that's resonating with the public. Rich, by executive definition, by executive definition, by Obama's definition, Rich is 250,000 a year. I guess he relented, and now it's 400,000 a year for an individual and 450 for a couple. Um, that may be rich. It may be a very good earning, but it doesn't mean that you're rich. Taxes will go to 65 percent. They're going way back up again, and so you're going to need to protect yourselves under these circumstances. You're going to need to take more risk investments and deal with these things. The the politicians are fomenting the poor, rich dynamic, and it's working. It's working beautifully. Your course of action? In the United States, your wealth will be increasingly confiscated or destroyed through repression, taxation, spending, and executive order. Therefore, you must eschew currency, the dollar and every fiat currency you can think of. You must own precious metals in kind. You must allocate to discovery stocks, because I think discovery stocks are the one place you can make significant headway. This includes food, fertilizer. I'm speaking tomorrow on potash and fertilizer in a workshop. Water, precious metals, and infrastructure. 
Our Discovery Investing Scoreboard allows you to test discovery opportunities. It's absolutely free. There are 1,300 users. There are over 860 companies crowd-scored by the 10-factor discovery model. It accesses all U.S., Canadian, Aussie, and Hong Kong companies. And you can get on by simply going to www.discoveryboard.com. Uh, the top decile of companies, um, I'm going to just show you a few. And I'm, this is not a recommendation. It's simply how the crowd is scoring these companies. These top deciles tend to outperform other companies. They're updated independently by the crowd. They identify what the crowd likes about a company and what factors the crowd dislikes about each company. And so here are, here are a few. This is not a recommendation. These are how the crowd scores the companies. There is a very significant proportion of silver companies. Of the 864 companies, I think seven of these are silver companies. Um, and you can see the last update on some of them. Some of them are not recent. Some of them are. But they are Central Coast Energy, Oracana, Silver Wheaton, Almaden, Predium, Mag Silver, New Gold Mining, New Strike Capital, Endeavor Silver, and Franco Nevada Corporation. Please look at this. Log on. You don't even have to use it. Nobody will know who you are. And you can, uh, you can, you can update these if you like. But these are available to you. I think you need to be looking at risk, thinking about risk, and thinking about those 10 baggers that will help you tread water as the U.S moves towards its ultimate socialist state. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. God bless you.